Coming up next on Futures in Biotech, we talk to Dr. Darren Croft about his work as a mammalian paleontologist. We talk about pulling the bones out of the stones and giant swimming sloths. So stay tuned. Oh, quick addendum. Uh, we had a little bit of audio difficulty at the start of the show. Uh, the mic audio uh, was coming out of the Logitech uh, cameras. Um, and that was my fault, not Borg's. So uh, again, my apologies. And hang in there. The audio gets much better as uh, the show goes on. Thank you. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is... Is twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 68. Rats will inherit the earth. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there going to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would be equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy of some Long part, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that like rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun's the center of the universe so this and that and everything you know here's somebody who can come out and say hey look here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative welcome to futures in biotech i'm mark peltier today's guest is darren croft he's a an associate professor in the department of anatomy at case western reserve university and he's a paleo mammologist or paleo paleontologist uh, with a specialty in mammals so this show is an extension uh, a little bit of, of the past show um, with Jack Horner, um, you know, the famous uh, paleontologist who uh, is the curator of the Museum of the Rockies. And I thought it'd be great to do a couple of shows uh, in paleontology uh, side by side, because then we could see this huge contrast, um, you know, uh, from, from dinosaurs to mammals. And uh, the fossil record is... Uh, is ever more present with mammals. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Darren to the show. And I apologize if there's a little bit of lag between our camera shots. We're using uh, an open source uh, solution here called CamTwist to uh, switch be between cameras. But uh, so welcome to the show, Darren. Thanks. thanks. It's great to be here. Th thanks for coming in. Uh, he walked basically across the street. And uh, little did I know there was somebody who makes a living digging for bones, which is an amazing thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I, I don't know, in all honesty, I, I think I make a living teaching anatomy and they just let me do the other on the side, but it all works. Well, teaching anatomy, yeah, that's pretty, com comparative vertebrate anatomy or comparative mammalian anatomy from, you know, ancient mammals. Yeah, well, I actually just do human anatomy for my teaching. Really? Yeah, but, it, you know, all the mammals to a first degree, we're all pretty much the same, same bones, same muscles, you know, some gets bigger, some gets smaller, but if you know a lot about humans, you really actually know a lot about a number of other mammals, too. So if you're in Bolivia and Chile and you're digging and you find a human bone, you'll know it. <laughs> yeah, we, we try to avoid those. There's uh, too many politics associated with human bones and things like that. Right. Well, what happens if a grave was dug, uh, graves were placed, or uh, um, graveyard was placed on top of a great, you know, find for, for, for you know, ancient mammals, then what do you do? Do you still go in? And uh, depends how much credence you put in poltergeist, I guess. There's one thing that the movies have taught us, leave graves be. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sidetracking here. Really, it's, it's great to have you because um, I know very, very little about uh, paleontology. You could hardly pronounce it when we did our first show. And uh, so maybe you could tell us, um, you know, what does your job entail? Uh, when you're out in the field, uh, you do systematics, you do paleobiology, macroecology. All this um, is a huge uh, area that, well, I know nothing about. So maybe you could t start off with uh, with field work, right? What do you do and where do you go? And field work, I specialize in South American mammals and not all people obviously have a geographic specialization. Some people work on particular groups and so they might do field work here and there. I do most of mine in a couple countries, Bolivia and in Chile. Why there? 
partly has to do with the time periods that we're interested in and partly also with where they are in the continent. So Chile, I got involved with uh, my past advisor, now colleague. He had a long-term program there with some other folks. And that was really just another example, kind of like with Jack, of finding fossils where you didn't think they'd be. They'd originally gone down to the southern part of Chile to investigate some whale fossils. You believe that, they were up in the mountains. And these things had been lifted way high up. <laughs> and as they were working their way back, basically towards Santiago, checking out all the different rock formations, they were hoping to find some dinosaur age mammals because the rocks had been mapped to that age. But it turns out they found mammals, but they were a lot younger than that. And now that we've spent many years exploring, it turns out that this is a very large rock formation. So it spans hundreds of kilometers. Wow. And in many different places, you get great fossils. Wow. How old are those rocks that are exposed? Depending on where exactly we are, the oldest ones are probably 40 to 45 million. And the youngest ones get down to probably about 15 million. Wow. So when the dinosaurs going extinct about 65 million years ago, we're dealing with kind of the middle third. Right. So with uh, Jack, we talked about uh, 200 to 65 million years ago, or 250 million to 65 million. Yep. So you're you're working on the next phase, right? Yeah, exactly. Did you? How was the site discovered? And yeah, how was a how did they find that spot? Because right? that's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, you know, everyone loves dinosaurs. And this happens to be very close to a rock formation called the Banos del Flaco formation that is fairly well known down there because it's got dinosaur footprints. And they've been tilted up on end, and so you get a lot of people that go there. So it was a good reason to go there. There are dinosaur age rocks. Maybe there are other dinosaur age rocks that would have actual bones in them instead of tracks. And so the group went out there, happens to be in a near little town, and split up, spent the day hiking around, which is what we typically do, just walk around and look at the rocks and see if you find any bones. And one of the groups ended up finding some and brought them back. And then eventually they figured out what they were and then made subsequent trips. Gone back almost every year since then. That was back in, I think, 87 or 88. Wow. And uh, so did, did they age the rocks once they found out the bone, what the bones were to determine what the uh, not dinosaurs, but these mammals were? Or did, uh, did they know what they were just from reconstructing the uh, skeletons? The first step, usually you can get a good ballpark age of something just if you can recognize what it is. So if you go back to dinosaur age rocks, most of the mammals are pretty small. There are some exceptions, but they tend to be small, they tend to be rare. Anytime you find a bigger mammal, you can be pretty sure you're dealing in younger rocks than that. But as far as where they were in that last 65 million years, I don't think we knew right off the bat. Once you start comparing them to fossils that have been found in other places, you know, we've got a pretty good record of how the different mammals change, then you can get even a narrower range, let's say five to 10 million years, uh, maybe even more depending on uh, particular mammals that you're looking at. So the first mammals were all small. Of course, they had to start off small. First mammals in terms of first mammals in the world? Well, the ones, so when did the first mammals appear? Interestingly, it's about the same time the first dinosaurs did. Really? Yeah, so you're talking 100, uh, 200 to 250 million years ago. And it just so happened that dinosaurs got the upper hand, <laughs> as it were, and they were able to at least be the big conspicuous things for a long time. Mammals were around, and they were, they, they were doing some different things, but they're mostly, you know, a lot less conspicuous right. until where are they the now? extinction. <laughs> that, <you know. laughs> where are they now? Exactly. Well, I guess they're flying around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. We're they're actually, them at, uh, if you count the birds, uh, there are a lot more species of birds than there are mammals, but mammals are calling the shots in most places at least. So they laid low for some 200 million years, or 150 million years. They stayed down, stayed quiet, and didn't do a whole lot. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but yeah, that's, that's basically it. But they were around the whole time, so if you go out to, let's say, some Ajax sites out there in Montana, you will find small jaws and, you know, skulls that are maybe a couple inches long in the same rocks with the dinosaurs. And there are people that specialize on those very early mammals, too. Cool. So... I guess I'm going to bounce around here because I, I, I have no clue, and I apologize to the audience on this, which way to take this uh, story. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your first... Okay, so you went on, on the, the hikes or the groups went on hikes, and I started to see uh, bones. They identified some in the rocks that they were looking for. So what do you do from there? Then you say, uh-oh, there's some bones here. Uh, who owns the land? Is it government land? Private land? Well, that gets into another issue, and a lot of it depends on the country. 
In the U.S., where we value private land a lot, we, you actually own the fossils on your land. But that's not the norm for a lot of other countries in the world. Most of South American countries, fossils of things like mammals are the property of the state. Oh, wow. So even if it's private land, generally you want to, as a courtesy, go get permission for it, but they really can't say, no, these are my fossils. The reality of it is most places we're looking for fossils aren't, pe aren't places where people care a whole lot about the land because people that are out in the, in the boondocks where we're looking are mostly going to be ranchers and things like that. Mm -hmm. They're more concerned with the nice pasture land. We're, of course, scrambling around the rock faces and looking in the dirt and things like that. So they typically don't have a problem with us hiking around on the rock faces and collecting the fossils. Okay, so how do you collect the fossils? Depends on the type of rock that we're dealing with. In Chile, it's, I'd say it's out of the ordinary because we're dealing with these really hard rocks called volcanic plastics. And these are rocks that we think form from lahars. And lahars are a term that refer to these volcanic debris flows. So you've got these volcanoes that, that have been in Chile for a long time. The Andes Mountains haven't been that high, not as high as they are for a long time, but the volcanoes we think have been there. And you get ash and snow that accumulates on top if they're high enough, certainly, for the snow. And periodically, if you get an eruption, it can melt the snow, or you get a rainfall that comes down really quickly, and it'll mobilize all of this ash, and it'll just flow downhill really quick. And these are things that still happen today in various parts of the world. Obviously, very bad news if your village is down there at the bottom of a mountain. But if you're interested in preserving fossils or bones, they can be good because the bones will also get swept up. And if the conditions are just right, then they'll be preserved. The downside is that they can also be very, very hard because they're derived from these volcanic ashes and things like that. And that's what we're dealing with in, in Chile. So we often have to chisel them out of the rock rather than just, you know, if you go and look on the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. and see people working with brushes and awls, they're, they're typically working in very fine rocks, sandstones and mudstones and things like that. Ours, we have to go out with a chisel and a hammer, and we literally just chisel it out of the rock. It's like, it'd be like chiseling it out of the side of a building. Right. Is it kind of like having Han Solo, you know, stuck in that block and you have to sort of, is it completely fused? <laughs> or when you get down to the, the bone, can you edge it away? Did the, are the bones stronger than the rock? I mean, at one point, that's a big question. That's another challenge with this, this rock formation we call the Albanico Formation. It varies with each particular site. Okay. And I think it also varies on the specimen. We have people who are experts in doing that, and they're called fossil preparators. And they're the ones that clean the fossils. So when we take a fossil out of the field, we will leave a lot of stuff around, a lot of matrix. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get too close in case we damage it. We'll bring that block back, and then the preparator's job is to do just what you're saying there, try to get that <laughs> separation between the bone and the rock. Sometimes it's, there's great separation, right. and it just pops right off. Other times it's a real challenge. Do you ever get a grad student that's carving up that, that rock to make it look like bone? <laughs> <laughs> you know... That wouldn't fly very long. No, not so much. It's funny, though, on, on old specimens, it used to be in vogue to reconstruct parts in plaster. Sure. Just to make it look like a nice skull. And sometimes when your museum collection's working, it can be tough if they paint it to figure out where's the real bone, Ooh. where's the plaster. And sometimes we'll go through and remove it after the fact. So we're talking about trying to separate rock uh, from bone. And, and, you know, I guess when your sample has a load of plaster in it, because uh, curators at the museum are trying to show what it looks like in, in full. Um, are the skeletons that we look at at, at most of the museums, are they real or are they plaster casts that are uh, copies of the... It runs the gamut. Depends on the specimen, depends on the museum. Early on, I think the trend was to put all the bones there to make it look complete, fill in bones that you didn't have, and try to disguise them or at least make them blend in. But now museums have been moving back towards displaying the real bones, which I think is, is good for the public, but it also, you know, there are some conservation issues there. You don't want to damage these unique specimens, and it's a lot more expensive. But you'll see a lot more these days real bones being on display, and if they do put uh, other bones in their reproductions to fill it in, they'll let you know which are the real ones and which aren't. However, you know, for a lot of animals, there's only, let's say, one really good skeleton. Right. In which case, uh, actually a good example is here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. One of the claims to fame of Cleveland, and this Natural History Museum in particular, is that it has a skull of this animal called Dunkleosteus, which is this predatory fish, basically oh, the, the shark version. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very old. We're talking about 360 to 400 million years old, but it's a huge skull. 
and it's got the best one in the world. And what they do is they make reproductions and museums all over the world will, will display that skull because it's really the only one that's out there. Sure, and, and as long as you say this is a reproduction, it, it still will impart this ultimate fear of getting eaten by one when you go swimming in Lake Erie. <laughs> so these things are huge. I mean, it's almost, it, I guess my impression is that it's the size of the front of a Volkswagen Beetle, but it's, it's really not quite that big, more of a large snowmobile. <laughs> but it's got this, these evil fangs. Right? They're immense. Yeah, it's interesting because they don't have real teeth. They basically have bones that have big points right. that they use as teeth, <laughs> and, they're, and they're honed. Gouging points. <laughs> it, it's really, it's, yeah, it's an impressive animal. Yeah, tear you up, tear you, <laughs> tear you up in three parts. Um, I, so you, um, you're out there in the field. You look at the various kinds of rocks. You're, you're, you find a great specimen. You use mostly chisel and and uh rock hammer rock hammer or sledgehammer sledgehammer and you go really carefully how long does it take to extract uh i mean what happens when you first find one you go like all right this is the coolest thing uh this is <laughs> is the is the most fun the discovery or finally assembling the, the pieces of the puzzle i think the discovery is definitely up there but there's almost a second discovery when the specimen actually gets cleaned i don't think anyone likes extracting the fossils. <laughs> right. How long does it take? It's high stress because, you know, you could just crack right through. If it's a little specimen, five or ten minutes maybe. If it's a big specimen, it could take a day or several days. So it really varies in the size of the specimen. If there are other cracks already, natural cracks in the rock. Have you ever had a really great specimen and said, wow, this is the nicest skull of a something something rather? <laughs> Throw in, what's the name of a dinosaur? Uh, no, uh, no, a, sorry, a, an ancient mammal. An ancient mammal. Uh, how about a Hachita theory? Okay, so you find one of these skulls and it's spectacular and you're going to, you're sweating beads and then all of a sudden it cracks into it. Oh, yeah. Is, are you like really upset or can it be glued back together? Fortunately, they can be glued back together. All right. It, it is stressful though. <laughs> the worst part is that... But then Horner says, ha ha, amateur. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, the, one of the challenges in Chile is we do this process where we've got this big rock with a fossil in the middle of it. We want to try to whack off pieces of the matrix to make it... <laughs> Jason, don't Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> out of... Um, make it as small as possible, right? Because we've got to bring these things back. Right. And they're very heavy. So you play this game where you're trying to make it as small as possible without actually damaging the fossil, but sometimes it just goes right through the middle of it. We glue it back together if that's the case, or actually a lot of times what we'll do is we won't glue it because you don't want to get dust in there. Mm -hmm. We'll wait to go back to the lab to glue it, but sometimes the teeth especially, because they're very brittle, they can be powdered. Right. I, I guess it doesn't really matter because the science will still be the science if you've got, you know, 500 parts versus 450 parts because several of the parts have come apart, you can fix them. You can put them back together and really rebuild that skeleton. It's, I guess it's how many bones that you find. It's not how intact the skeleton is, right? To some extent, it, it a lot depends That's on which teeth. part it is. Right. Yeah, teeth can be really important. If you happen to hit a tooth that has the key characteristic that differentiates this species from that species, then it's lost a lot of information. But, you know, if, if it's a rib bone, usually not so big a deal. Yeah, nice, big, and clear. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to walk us through uh, your experience. I mean, you, you're, in, you're high in the mountains. How, what, what altitude is this at? In Chile, we're mostly dealing with about 2,500 meters to 3,500 meters, right. which uh, puts us at, I don't know, I'd say 8,000 to 10,000 feet maybe. In Bolivia, we get up higher than that, and in northern Chile, we're up over 4,000 meters. So you're talking... 12,000, sometimes up to 14,000 feet. And you want to go during the summer, right? In Chile, yes, because it's a little more temperate. It's at about the same latitude as the southern U.S. So we want to go when it's summer because they have a Mediterranean climate. Summer dry, winter wet. It's nice. And we're up in the mountains, so it's not quite so yeah, hot. But that's your academic year here. Uh, yes, Austral summer. Yes, that's true. Which is another benefit of teaching in the medical school because the way the anatomy is set up, it's not a Monday, Wednesday, Friday every week, mm -hmm. oh, okay. all weeks. And so there are gaps where we can take two or three weeks off. We don't typically go for months on it. Okay. So we can take two or three weeks off typically to go down to Chile. In Bolivia, it's in the southern part of the tropics. And its weather ha varies a little bit, and it gets rains in the summer. Okay. So we need to go, summer. yeah, in the austral summer. Okay. So we typically go in their spring, 
late spring into winter into fall. So have you ever found a really nice uh, specimen and then had to leave it and then to go back to it? We have on occasion, usually not a great specimen, but sometimes if there's something just so large that you can't take it out with the tools that you have, then we'll photograph it, we'll GPS it, we'll take coordinates, we'll keep it in our field notes, and then we'll hide it sometimes we'll get it back bushes. there. <laughs> you know, usually the things we leave, they'd be so tough that we're not worried about someone else right. taking them out. So plane ticket, them I guess you delay the plane flight, right? That's when you tell your wife, I'm sorry, but I gotta, I, I gotta stay. If we had to. Fortunately, it hasn't really happened that we found something so big that we can't get out. Benefits of working on mammals. Pardon me? Be the benefits of working on mammals. It is. Yep, definitely. Although some of the mammals get pretty big, especially when you're talking about the younger ones as they get closer to where we are now. You get some huge elephant sized animals down in South America. Wow. Sloths. Kind of, I, and, wow. Um, what's the biggest animal you found? Hmm. I guess these are, are random shotgun questions. We should, you know, focus on the field work, but yeah, that's this right. is kind of stuff that's crossing my mind here. How... The, well, the biggest ones that we have at our sites are, it's what we found, are called astrapathiers, which are large. They probably were kind of hippo-like in their habits, probably spent a fair bit of time in the water, but these were animals that weighed a ton, potentially more than that, and so a skull is going to be two to three feet long. Oh, wow. Now, we don't, haven't ever found a whole astrapathier, in reality, often what we found is a tooth or one of the tusks or part of the jaw. So it hasn't been too tough excavating those parts. But those are the, that's the biggest animal parts that we found. And so you, you've now gone, dug, chipped away, made a huge block of series of bones, and you're pretty sure they're all in there. You bring them back to the lab here at Case in uh, Cleveland? Most of our specimens from Chile get prepped at the American Museum of Natural History because it has a big preparator's lab and... Uh, one of our collaborators is there, and, and we've got it arranged where a lot of uh, the funds that we get from the National Science Foundation go to support that preparation. So they all go back there, and then we have an agreement with Chile mm -hmm. that when all is said and done, we will divide up some of the specimens. Some of the originals go back to Chile, a small proportional state here in the U.S., and then we make casts for everyone. Okay. So we'll get copies, both parties, for whichever ones are in the other place. In Bolivia, they all stay down in Bolivia for now. We're hoping that eventually we'll get back to the spot where we can take them out and clean them, but all the preparation for now has to be done down in Bolivia. Here's a question that came across my mind. I guess it's kind of it's not in the sequential order here, but um, what if the rock that you have to carry out weighs uh, a half a ton, and you're like you got a 14 mile hike to get to that spot? The chopper? Is it chopper? <laughs> to get the, are there any like you know choppers out there that are part of the anti-drug trade thing? <laughs> we, do, we do use helicopters on occasion in Chile, okay. mostly because some of the spots we want to get to, you just either can't get to literally, or it would take so long that you're going to spend half your time just hiking up there or taking horses or mules up there. More of it is just that standpoint rather than actual weight of fossils. We, we truck out whatever fossils we find. We haven't had it yet where we've had too many to backpack out. So what we were talking about, um, you know, carrying very large samples uh, out of the forest and you're 20 miles in, you hike there, it took you two days, uh, you're sleeping in tents and you found a, a Janamosaur, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I got this as a beautiful specimen. This is the first one in the world. We got to get it out of here. And you were saying sometimes use helicopters uh, to get into the most difficult spots. Yeah, but usually we're close enough to the trucks that if we can get it to the truck, which is what we usually take in and out, it's pretty easy to get the fossil out. The hairy part can be if you get something big and you're excavating up high in the mountains, it, it can be dicey coming back down with a you know, 20, 30, 40 pound of rocks in your backpack. So that's probably potentially the worst part. So for the uh, listening audience, uh, Darren's fit. So you obviously exercise <laughs> and spends a lot of time. So this, this seems like a good workout. It's a great workout, actually. Carrying you know, rocks and bones. Wow. Yeah, we have, we've had a couple sites, one in particular, one of these we helicoptered into, but you start off the day doing what we call the Stairmaster because you're basically hiking up, I don't know how, how far it is. Um, it takes you about probably about an hour where you're just hiking straight up a dry stream bed the whole time. Oh, yeah, that's hard on your knees, too. Uh, yeah, but... At the end of the day, when you're tired, yeah, and you've got a sack full of rocks, 
I think that's even worse. <laughs> it's really your, you know, your quads are getting tired out. And right. so that's, that's where you've got to be careful coming How back. Many grad students do you have, do you, do you work in teams and you, you must supervise grad students as well? I do have some grad students. None of the ones that I have right now have gone with us down to the field. We usually have a pretty small crew because we just have one truck that we take that usually only holds four people or so. Okay. So sometimes we get some Chilean grad students that go with us. Mm -hmm. One of our colleagues, Andy Weiss, who's out at Santa Barbara, they have a, he's in a geological sciences department there. And so he often has students, master students and PhD students that'll come down. So we've had ones that have come down and have mapped all the rocks in certain areas or that have studied certain sites. So sometimes we'll have six or eight people in the field if we've got a big crew, but oftentimes it's just three or four of us. Right. And when I said grad students, that's when the Indiana Jones whip came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's when the whip's handy for a paleontologist. It's not necessarily for defense, right? No, no, definitely. The, the Bolivia, we make a little more use of the students. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, machetes? Do you have machetes? No, we don't usually carry it's not, machetes. It's, it's, I guess it's open ground, right? For the most part. Yeah. Some of our southern Chile sites, you can get us some pretty hairy um, stands of bamboo and things like that where you could really use machete. But for the most part, it's more scrambling on rocks and low bushes and things like that. How about cougars? Cougars, we haven't run across any yet. Okay. But they have, I think they have the largest range of any terrestrial mammal. They range from, you know, northern North America all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. Yeah. So they're certainly there. Yeah, we've seen footprints of them before in oh. some sites. Well, that's good. I mean, you've got rocks though. <laughs> so you're okay. You're pretty well protected. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and the bugs are minimal, which is really what I love about where we work. It's high and dry and without mosquitoes, it's beautiful. Uh, that, I guess that makes sense, especially if, do you sleep outside when you're uh, on a, a dig? Yep. Yeah, sometimes in a tent, oftentimes not. Especially in Chile, there's really no need. You know, there's, it's not going to rain. You don't have bugs. Good stars. You can watch the stars are fantastic. Yeah, they're amazing. How far south is this in Chile? Because Chile goes all the way up and down the coast, right? It does. Santiago, the capital, is about in the middle of the country. And it's at latitude about 32 or 33, right in that range. So we're just in the first or second region to the south of that, mm -hmm. basically central, south central. Guys, yeah, I was thinking if it was far enough south, you'd see uh, some, uh, not Aurora Borealis. What is, what's the southern Aurora Borealis called? Uh, I don't know. I was told there'd be no <laughs> astronomy Austro questions on it. Australia Borealis. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think it has something to do with Australia. Maybe the uh, chat room. Oh, but it's not. It's not important here. We're not talking about space science. Here. <laughs> We're talking about uh, uh, pa paleontology and paleomimology. Uh, okay, so I, I think we've got a good understanding, good sense, a, a feel for what it's like to uh, find, identify, and or, or find them. How do you identify them? Okay, so there's a whole area of systematics. What's what's what, what can be done? Well, there are all sorts of things that can be done. The field work's a lot of fun, and it's you know, the excitement of discovery and all that. But systematics also has a little bit of excitement of discovery in it too, I think. Once you get the fossil back, once it's cleaned, you can actually see the different parts of the anatomy that are important, parts of the teeth, parts of the skull, whatever you have. And then you go to the collections, if you're close to museum collections, or you go to literature. A lot of what we do deals with looking at pictures in the literature and trying to figure out what it is. And then Oftentimes later on, you verify it by looking at, it, at other real fossil specimens. But you try to nail it down. Maybe right offhand, you know easily what family it is because it has this many teeth and they're this size. But then trying to figure out what species it belongs to really gets down to the details. And it's kind of fun to go through the process and see if this is something new, if it's something that's not new. Sometimes even if the species is known, it can be important because you're extending the range. So you're using fossil record though. You're using the, the, the shape of the fossil you're not using any other methods, are you using aging to determine? Because how long does a, a mammalian species stick around? People have done studies on that. I think the average genus, which is the next level up from a species, a group of related species, is on the order of a few million years. So there's a pretty high turnover rate. If you're looking at one fauna that's 25 million years old and another one that's 20, most of those are virtually all will be different species. And you'll probably have a lot of different genera too. But it all relies on anatomy. You can use the age if you know what it is to help narrow down your search, but fundamentally you need to be looking at the fossils because you never know, maybe you're just looking at the earliest occurrence of that species. And so you don't really want to use the age as a criterion for figuring out what it is. How about developmentally? I mean, this is a question I asked Jack Horner. How do you know if it's just not a different aged 
you know, an animal with a different right. age or a female or something, if no females have ever been identified or no males have ever been identified, if there's, um, what do you know, dimorphism, you know, how do you, how do you, I, I guess you don't until there's five or six of them and they, they. Right. Yeah. That gets at a couple different questions. One is development ontogeny. Is it a juvenile? Is it an adult? You can get at that to some extent by looking at the bones because in adults, they fuse up. And in juveniles, you'll still see spaces between different parts okay. of a bone. And oftentimes you can tell with the teeth because just like with humans, we get teeth that erupt at different times. And it's not until you're an adult that you get your last tooth in there, your wisdom tooth. Mm -hmm. So that'll give you some idea of whether something is juvenile or an adult usually. But there can still be changes once something becomes an adult. And maybe young adults look different from old adults. And that can be tougher. Sometimes it takes a good sample size, which you may not always have in the fossil record. There are other techniques that you can use. One of the things that we're doing across the street there with uh, one of my good anthropological colleagues there, Scott Simpson, who's one of the guys who works on hominids involved with all the arty stuff, is we're looking at sectioning the teeth. Because if you take a close look at the enamel in some of these animals, it turns out there's basically a daily counter that you can, do, you can look at. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that we'll be able to figure out absolute ages in days of some of these animals, or at least a typical lifespan, and try to use that to get at that. How do you, uh, light microscopy? Or is it, uh, yep. you have to go SCM or something? Nope, it's light microscopy. Yeah, we do thin sections, and it has to do with how the cells that lay down enamel, they, um, every so often, and people aren't exactly sure why this is, but they create these lines that you can see and it's correlated with time. And if you look at these, have looked at a lot of these enough, then you can actually get a counter. It's kind of like the tree ring analogy, a little bit different. So you're, you're born, you know, 15 million years before dentists and you still have to go, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> it, you know, mammals is all about teeth. That's one of the things that make mammals unique. That's one of their characteristics, the facts that we have, not that we have teeth. Little teeth. Obviously dinosaurs have <laughs> teeth. The fact that we have complex teeth that they occlude precisely mm -hmm. and that they're differentiated in the jaw. So we've got different shaped ones in the front and in the back. Nothing else really has that to the same degree that we get in mammals. And it's this whole suite of characteristics that we think really led to the success of the group. So with that, really, so we're here because of teeth. That, I would argue that. Dentist. Yep. And a lot of people would too. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Teeth are, teeth are where it's at. Not now, I, you know, maybe it's a consolation. You don't have to have Global teeth to make a living. conquest as a species. <laughs> Because of teeth. It's all right? about good teeth. Right. Yep. And, and, and T-Rex, he had some awesome teeth, right? Yep. T-Rex, they work pretty well. But yeah. that's basically what goes on in a crocodile. So they're all pretty much the same. Right. And T-Rex didn't use them for chewing. Right. Right. It's basically grab, kill, and swallow, which or, is... Or as Horner says, just scavenge. Right. In which case, it's just grab and swallow, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. And uh, But you're not doing any processing with them. But most people that I know... It's not just grab and swallow. You got to chew it up. And that's really what mammals do better than anything else. And so you're looking, are you, when, when you have a, a specimen, is it the teeth, your starting point for, for the systematics? Almost always. Almost always. Because there's a lot of information in the teeth, not only about what it's related to, but also about its lifestyle. What it ate. Based on the size of the teeth, you can get a good idea of how big something was. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of what we call phylogenetic information, which is what is, is it related to? Now, there's no DNA left, right? After, you know, a couple million years, I guess it has to be frozen for the DNA to be intact. Right. That's my understanding that the oldest DNA that we've recovered so far is in, on the order of tens of thousands of years old, that they haven't gotten any older than that. Tens um, of thousands. Yeah, so it's like 80,000 maybe. I don't know if yeah. that but, would be my guess. Do but, you know about Dave Hostler's project of uh, Genome 10K? Sequence 10,000 mammalian genomes? No. One of the, per, one of the points or interesting parts about the project is by having the consensus sequence of 10,000 uh, mammals, you, you have the ancestral mammal, right? The common mammal to all those 10,000, right? You can go way back just by doing a complete uh, alignment of the genomes and finding out what's, what's similar to everyone. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's really the trick of it. Right. You know, there's a lot of great information in DNA and I wish I knew more about how it works, right. <laughs> but it turns out that, yeah, there are, there are some techniques that are better than others and some of these small interspersed sequences that tend to give a really good signal. So yeah, if you can line them up, you could at least get the common ancestor for everything that's alive today. Well, you know, if you peel away two parts of a plasma membrane of a cell 
and you do it in, in the proper um, way, frozen, you can actually see the imprint of one protein in the upper bilayer and then the protein stuck in the bottom bilayer. I'm just wondering if in your bones you have information of imprints of you know molecules, just the way the atom's positioned. If you really, I mean, it'd be impossible, certainly in our technology to be able to pick that up. But what if there's shadows of ancient DNA in those? And, and the thing with the mammal, it wouldn't be that hard to bring them back, right? Especially, uh, no, <laughs> but I digress. Yeah, it's actually, there was an interesting editorial, I think it was an editorial not that long ago in Science or Nature about bringing back the mammoth. And you can do it. There are a lot of issues <laughs> that, you know, other than just getting the sequence of development and everything else. And I, not, I'm not saying we could never do it, but this is a rat. It's not quite as about bringing back ancient mammals. <laughs> but if you think about it, um, with the Neanderthal genome done, right? Uh, and right now it would cost about $10 million to, to synthesize from scratch an entire uh, um, uh, human sized genome. And it, I guess if you, you swap the genes one at a time in an embryonic stem cell culture, you could eventually replace every single gene to include the entire ne Neanderthal genome and do exactly what Venner did. Uh, right now, that would cost hundreds of millions, but you know, at the, the, the rate of cost going down for uh, doing this kind of work, who knows? Uh, it's technically feasible. We could bring back the Neanderthal, which would might be even scarier than bringing back a mammoth, right? I think there are probably some ethical issues there that you don't run into with elephants. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get back to reality here. You're using the fossil record, and when you're going out there and, and or you look at the uh, these creatures that you've you've pulled away, do you see it as um, it, it must feel like you're discovering another planet, right? Because these are animals that don't exist, um, not around today. Maybe related, maybe ancestors. Um, what drives you? Is it the discovery of finding something absolutely bizarre and new, or is it, um, is it uh, more the history? The I think it's a little bit of both. You always, it's nice to be able to make a definitive contribution that's new. When you find a fossil, you know, you're definitely contributing new data, and part of it is you don't know what that can be useful for for analysis in the future. And partly it's just fun, right? Right. going out and finding these things. Absolutely. It's like an Easter egg hunt, sort of for adults. But the big picture really is understanding the history of South America. And for mammals in particular, South America is a lot like Australia is today, if we go back in the fossil record. That meaning that all the groups that were there were endemic, meaning they were found there and nowhere else. Which is not the case if you go back in the fossil record of North America or Asia or Europe. Certainly the species are extinct, but a lot of times they'll belong to groups that are still around, things like dogs or cats or, or even the cattle group. But in South America, a lot of these are not closely related to things alive today, and they're totally extinct. And it really is in that way, more like, as you said, going to, going to a whole different world. And it's kind of cool to see a parallel world where the role of rabbits is filled by these notoungulates, and the role of hippos is filled by these astrapatheres. Wow. And you get sloths that aren't just small and hanging out in trees. You get ones that are huge and are probably grazing out in the grasslands. And you've got others that are swimming in the ocean and feeding on seagrasses. So it's really sloths? just amazing. Sloths. Swimming sloths. Swimming sloths. An amazing one called Thalassocnus, which was described, it's probably about 10 years ago now, off the coast of Peru. There's this formation called the Pisco Formation, mm -hmm. which if you're into grape distillates. This is one of the drinks down there. And this formation is named after it, but it's mostly a marine formation. You find whales and seabirds and you find these sloths in there. And it's a great example of an evolutionary transition. And you can see through time, working your way up in the section, how the structure of these sloths change and they get more and more adapted for being out in the ocean and feeding on these seagrasses. How important is it to know the ecosystem the, you know, that these animals are in to really understand these animals. Do you, when you pull out these animals, do you rely on uh, paleobotanists to, to really help you put the, the puzzle together? Because you guys are like, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, PIs, but you really are a principal investigator, but, you know, sort of <laughs> like a, a detective, right? You're trying to piece together a, a huge story. Right. Of an ecosystem that's no longer, but. Yeah. And if you want to put it in the context of something like CSI or crime scene investigators, it's similar in that you've got lots of different experts in different things. And if you really want a good picture of what happened, 
you want to pull all those people into it. Botanists, paleobotanists are great to have and they can be really useful. The fossil record is insidious because the particular conditions that tend to preserve fossil bones aren't the same ones that preserve leaf fossils. So usually where you have bones, you don't have leaves and where you have leaves, you don't have bones. So we often have to piece the two together to try to see where they overlap. But there are other things you can look at. You can look at pollen, fossil pollen, right. palynologists or what those are called, which can also give you some information about the plants. Now, pollen's not a bone, so how does it last? Yeah. I don't know the details <laughs> of it. It's, That's yeah, it's, that yeah exactly. Basketball. Well, they're small, and basically if they get incorporated into these muds, let's say at the bottom of a lake, mm -hmm. they get preserved in there. They're not physically smashed or anything like that. And then through time, the proteins and other parts of it just get replaced with minerals. Yeah, so you can turn anything almost into a fossil if the conditions are right. right. So you can look at pollen. You can look at phytoliths, which are little spicules, kind of like sand that are in the leaves. And those can tell you about the plants too. But even separate from just mammals and plants, both of which tell you a lot, you can look at snails, get some invertebrate paleontologists in there. They can tell you a lot about the habitat. You can look at the reptiles, if there are any reptiles around. That could be really useful. Place in Patagonia, let's say, that's 40 million years old. If you go there and you start finding alligator fossils, you know that it's not nearly as cold as it was, well, back then it wasn't as cold as it is now. Unless those alligators could tolerate the cold. Unless they could tolerate the cold. And I typically what we do is we tend to use a, a, a word called uniformitarianism, which essentially is things in the past operate pretty much like they do today. Mm -hmm. And we assume that for most animals. It may not be true. So it may not be true that crocodiles and alligators were always tropical or semi-tropical. Right. But it's a simpler explanation than saying, well, they probably were in the past and now it's just the tropical ones that have survived. But of course, if you use different lines of evidence, then that can help you determine whether or not that's true. Um, one of the questions that's in the chat room, I, I might as well uh, ask it now. Uh, there's questions about Megalodon. And ah. I, I don't see the... Carcardon Megalodon? Yeah. Why is that uh, a chat room? Why? It, oh, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, there are teeth of that that also, also come from the Pisco Formation. Okay. And I think it's... Ooh, the name has changed. It's no longer Carcardon megalodon. It's uh, Carcarales megalodon or something else like that. Mm -hmm. But that's just another animal that we do find in the Pisco Formation along with these sloths. Shark's teeth preserve very well. Their bones are mostly cartilaginous, so we don't get shark bones very often. It does happen on occasion. Shark's teeth you can find all over the place, partly because they're constantly replacing them. Um. Uh, also, well, I guess while we're at it, in the news, there's this big, in science, there's a big penguin that was found. I didn't even see the article. Somebody said, hey, make sure you ask him about the, the six-foot penguin. Oh, man. Did, it just came it? out? Yeah. So you haven't seen the article yet either. No. I got to admit, I can't read the journals every day they come out. I try to do it about every other week. But there was a pretty big one that came out a couple years ago, too. This one must be bigger. Yeah, it's like a six-foot It's penguin. a pretty tall penguin. Uh, it was brown. Brown and gray. <laughs> six foot penguin. So this is kind of the, the the reason I bring it up is it's partly that you're this is what you're experiencing, right? You're seeing dogs that are you know, the size of mice or uh, cows that are the size of you know I don't know hippos, right? Or you're, you're you're have you seen what are the extremes, the extreme biology that you've seen that that or one that you've maybe not dug out but you've witnessed and, and I think are what are the cool what are the coolest forms of biology that you've seen in the ancient world? Islands are pretty interesting. And that's where you get a lot of this gigantism and dwarfism, they call it. Big things that get small and small things that get big. Um, and I've done a little bit of research in the Philippines, looking at some of these bison, these buffalo that get small there, which is kind of fun. But just in terms of an impressive specimen, one of the neatest things I found was this animal called paraborhyena. And this is one that was described about 30 years ago. And it is a marsupial. So it's related to possums and things like that that we have here. And more distantly related to the marsupials in Australia. But it was a meat eater. And in South America, if we go back in the mammal fossil record, the only meat eaters until fairly recently were these marsupials. And this one was a bear-sized marsupial. And wow. the jaw on this animal is a foot long. And it's just a massive jaw that's four inches deep. And it has a canine tooth, a big pointy tooth, that's almost the size of a banana. 
just an amazing, amazing it's animal. It's an evil, evil it, marsupial. <laughs> it is. It really, I'm sure it was. It was It was the top predator when it was around. And totally unlike any any marsupial that's around today, of course. And um, it's just really kind of a neat example of the things that you find in islands. And, and South America really was an island continent. So you get a lot of strange things going on. Wow. So the, um, let, let's see. We, we've covered most of the topics. Um, patterns of species, diversities, and distribution. Have, you wanna, do you want to talk about that? Is this, are these general, general lines? Um, it's I, a pretty general line. That's really... I'd say the big picture, we can talk a lot about why it's fun to go out and collect fossils, which it is. And I think it's important to know what was where, when in the past. But the goal of all of this, my goal and that of a lot of other people who are working in paleontology is to really figure out what are the factors that affect the number of species and where they occur. You know, everyone wants to save the rainforests and conserve species. And our argument is, that if you look back over the past 65 million years, there's lots of information there about how they got to be how they are today. And if you understand that, that can help you in terms of conservation and predicting where are the important spots to conserve, you know, what groups have a better chance of surviving than others, and et cetera. And it's only this deep time perspective that, uh, it's only with that deep time perspective that you can really get that information. Really? And so that gets into species diversities and distributions. It's a fourth dimension to an ecosystem. It is, it definitely is. And ecosystems aren't static, right? They're always changing. The only constant is, is change really. But we as humans get a really short term vision of change in ecosystems. And if someone does a really great research project over 40 years of data, you know, we think that's a huge data set, which it is, so but it still can't answer the same sort. It, you know, it can't answer questions about how do new groups form and over millions and tens of millions of years. So it takes both. Wow. So I, I guess really studying history, uh, even in the world of the, or in the life sciences, in the world of life, it's important too. So I, I think that's a great take home message that you, the more you know uh, about the history of life on earth, the more we can, you know, not screw up the next uh, <laughs> 45 million years, right? Definitely. Or at least hopefully have some idea how it might be screwed up if we do something like raise the temperature of the earth five degrees. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> so who's next, right, after us? Uh, yeah, that's... As, as somebody who's studied the life, life history of, you know, mammals, uh, are we doomed in the next uh, 20 million years or...? Uh, well, that's a good question. I guess on average, we're probably not going to last for a few million more. I mean, that would probably be doing well. And primates as a group, yeah, they do pretty well, but... Rats and bats are the two two groups that have really done very well. The rodents and the bats account for about two out of every three species of mammals on the earth. So if I was going to place my bet, it would it'd probably be on a rodent. A rodent, rodentia. So, yep. So maybe in uh, uh, five million years, there'll be rodentia species out there that's an intelligent that's p picked out the ecosystem of the brain uh, or, you know, knowledge, social, uh, creative creature. After that, arthropods, right? Yeah, that's yeah, true. I don't need giant roaches. <laughs> yeah, it's a, deserves it, giant the arthropods roaches. put mammals to shame in terms of diversity, <laughs> but but I digress. So, so this has been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate you you coming on to talk about uh, paleomammalogy. Um, it's un, it's it must be a, a sheer a pleasure to go out there in the field. In part, you're hiking, you're you're discovering, uh, digging your hands in the dirt, then you're getting back to the lab and piecing it all together using the highest technologies. Uh, it must be an absolute blast. And I thank you for sharing it with us. That was my pleasure. I appreciate the invitation to come on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, a few people who made this show possible. Uh, Burke McQuinn, thank you for handling the uh, audio and video boards today and uh, helping us through the technical difficulties. Um, I'd also like to thank the team at, uh, over in Petaluma, Leo Laporte, Lisa Kentzel, uh, Tony Wang, Frederick Louis, uh, Mike Taylor, John Slanina, uh, Ken Shepardson, and, and everyone else at, uh, in, in the team. Um, I'd also like to thank Phil Peltier and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. For comments and suggestions, uh, you can reach me at mark at twit.tv. That's M-A-R-C at twit.tv. And on Twitter at Mark Pelletier in one word, M-A-R-C-P-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.